Hello. Welcome to Pathognomia. This is Jay. I'm on my cytopathology rotation, and once a week, we give an interesting case conference, which allows us to present any interesting cases, as well as teach ourselves and our fellow residents. I will go over not very interesting cases, but nonetheless educational cases, because repetition is the key to adult learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's talk about the difference between a touch prep and FNA or fine needle aspiration and how they relate to difquid. So touch preps are cores of tissue usually taken by interventional radiology and we'll place it on the slide and smear it with the, uh, the fact that these cells, some of these cells will smear off of the tissue and onto the slide. And with that slide, we will stain it with the difquid stain. We don't usually stain with a corresponding PAP stain, which are stains used to help uh, better delineate nuclear features. Rather, you put the remaining tissue and put it in formalin, fix it in formalin, and then stain it with uh, hematoxylin and eosin, H and E, which has better quality than your PAP uh, stain. FNA, as you can see here, um, is this the sample collected is more liquid and you put it on the slide, you put the aspirate and then you dry it and then you do a diff quick stain. And any remaining aspirate, you do a pat stain because that again helps you better visualize the nuclear features. And then the remaining aspirate you can put in a cell block. In our institution, we use a cell block by putting expired plasma from the blood bank and fibrinogen. Remember, plasma has your coag factors, including thrombin. And if you add fibrinogen, factor one, the thrombin is going to convert the fibrinogen into fibrin and make a fibrin clot. So this is an example of a diff quick stain. And because you air dry it, there is artifact where the cell size artificially increase. So it's important to, to know that. Before we begin on our cases, I want to talk about the different classification systems. You may be tracking urine has the Paris criteria, the thyroid and cervix, Bethesda, the salivary glands, Milan, the pancreatic biliary, Papilla Nicolau, the breast, uh, Yokohama, and the lung, including Ebis and bronchioalveolar lavage, the WHO system. And why do we have these classification systems? Because it allows us to have a screening method that's trusted both within and across hospitals, and it provides useful, clear, clinically relevant information to the clinician. So, um, one last thing. This can be on exams and it's cap requirements. So for storage of cytoslides, the minimum amount of time we have to store them is five years. And for patient reports and QC reports, the minimum amount of time we have to keep them is two years. Okay, so let's begin. So this patient I'm talking about didn't get a lumbar puncture. It's a patient with prostate cancer with concern for a bony lesion. And remember, bony cancers with uh, bony mets are BLT with kosher pickle. So B is, um, oh gosh, <laughs> putting me on the spot. Um, B is breast, L is, I'm not sure, oh gosh. T is thyroid, L is lung. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's this late at night. Uh, again, BLT with a side of kosher pickle. So B, breast, L, lung, T, thyroid, kosher, K, kidney, and pickle, prostate. Okay, so again, this is a patient concerning uh, pro with prostate cancer concerning for a METS because there's a bony lesion. So this patient didn't get a lumbar puncture Instead, I, interventional radiology got a sample of that bony lesion. But I put this picture here because it shows you what the needle will penetrate. It'll penetrate skin, soft tissue, muscle, 
and bone as well as ligament. So we got a diff quick. And this is a representative picture of what the sample looked like. And you can see neutrophils, you can see megakaryocytes, you can see monocytes, and you can also see lymphocytes as well as background lice blood, so erythrocytes. So what do you have here? You have trilineage hematopoiesis. And that would, that would be what we expect on a bony lesion, or a, a, if we sample bone, because there's bone marrow. So I guess the question is, would this sample be adequate or not? Because it doesn't explain a mass, it, it would be inadequate. OK. So now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about these megakaryocytes. When you see megakaryocytes and you're sampling a bony lesion, it, you want to think about your differential, including osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Osteoclasts are multinucleated. They're very large. They have centrifugal nuclei, meaning the nuclei are kind of extruding, not in the center, but like towards the periphery. And they have prominent nucleolus and are more basophilic than these, this cytoplasm. Megs have more eosinophilic cytoplasm. They have more variation in their multinuclei, their the nuclei compared to each other within the same cell. And they have granules as well. And then osteoblasts are plasmacytoid, with the nuclei partially extruding from the cytoplasm. And is particularly, you want to be careful with osteoblasts when you have a patient with multiple myeloma with a bone lesion. You don't want to confuse osteoblasts for plasma cells and vice versa. Okay, so if by chance we did find prostate adenocarcinoma on the cell core or the, um, the cell block, excuse me, what stain can we order? We can order NKX 3.1. And it's important not to get confused with NKX 2.2, which uh, stains Ewing's sarcoma, which is completely different. So this was called inadequate. And we gave a comment saying that there's trilineage hematopoiesis, which would be expected in bone. Okay, next patient is a 50 something year old gentleman with multiple comorbidities, and there was concern for infection um, due to underlying pneumonia. Or I guess due to worsening, uh, they were concerned for worsening infection due to an underlying pneumonia. So before we begin to delve into this case, let's talk about bronchoalveolar lavage, its adequacies, and what it is, and its uses. So it's when the, you use a bronchoscope to go into one of the segments of the lung lobes and you inject sterile isotonic saline and you try to aspirate around 100 to 300 milliliters at a time using 20 milliliter aliquots or so. It has many uses and in fact one use is therapeutic and that's for when there is a patient with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis or PAP. Also, it can be diagnostic. Uh, it can help see whether there's infection like PCP or pneumocystis pneumonia. It can also help diagnose if there's fungal elements and as well as more, not as sensitive or specific, but nonetheless can be useful. Uh, entities like hypersensitivity pneumonia, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So um, what can we expect in a bronchoalveolar lavage? Again, remember this water, the saline goes through the alveolar system uh, or through the alveoli. So you can expect in the alveolar compartment, alveolar lining cells, type one pneumocytes, type two pneumocytes, which uh, just kind of reference trying to extend it to kind of IHC staining, which should be stained with napsin. 
cytoplasmic and TTF1, which is nuclear, as well as alveolar macrophages, which also stain with NAPs and cytoplasmic. But um, generally in bronchoalveolar lavages, we'll only see the alveolar macrophages. So that's an adequacy criteria. Um, so this is an example of what we found. And as you can see here, these are alveolar macrophages, but sometimes it can be hard to see them because there's just so much background inflammation and the predominant background infl inflammatory cell are neutrophils. And it's important to note, for instance, this case we gave the approximate percentage of the inflammatory cells, the neutrophils, EOs, or lymphs, because the presence of newts or presence of EOs or presence of lymphocytes creates another creates its own differential. So with a lot of newts, as you can see here, uh, differentials include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, bacterial infection, asbestosis, collagen vascular disease. If we saw a lot of EOs, we'd be concerned for eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis pul with pulmonary or um, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, uh, allergic bronco pulmonary aspergillosis or a drug response. And for lymphocytes predominant, we can expect hypersensitivity pneumonia or TB. So it's important, that's why we give the percentage of the background inflammatory composition. And it's important to know that bronchoalveolar lavage and the predominant cell type has its own differential compared to an effusion specimen that has a predominant inflammatory cell back, uh, population. That itself has a, a different differential. It's because those, they're in different locations that they have the different differentials. Um, okay, so in our case, because we saw a lot of newts and because a clinical history was concerning for infection, we got a, a GMS stain. And GMS can be dirty but here we're able to see kind of broad-based budding. And the question is, do we speciate on cyto or histo? No, we do not, because it, the sensitivity and specificity, um, specificity to delineate this particular species is not as great. Um, so it, I mean, our initial thought was, could this be blasto with the broad-based budding? But in fact, um, this is a Candida species, a Candida tropicalis. And I wanna to talk to you about, kind of connect it with micro, where we have, you can use the chrome agar Candida plate, and that it has a selected medium for fungal or candidal isolation. And each species produce enzymes that react with particular chromogenic substances. So Canada albicans would be light green, Canada dublinensis would be darker green, Canada tropicalis would be dark blue or a metallic blue, Canada cruci would be light pink, and Canada glabrata would be uh, more of a dark pink. So this was signed out as adequate, and the we gave the percentage of inflammatory cell infiltrates and then mentioned the presence of fungal elements. Okay, now let's talk about the thyroid. This is the using the Bethesda classification system and there are six categories. There's one, non-diagnostic or unsat, and this is when you have cyst fluid only or virtually acellular. And the management will be repeat FNA with ultrasound. Uh, two is benign, which includes follicular nodules, Hashimoto's, subacute thyroiditis, and you would also do kind of, you would do a follow-up and ultrasound. Three is atypical, atypia of uncertain significance, or AUS. Uh, four is follicular neoplasm, or uh, synonymous is suspicious for follicular neoplasm, and you would specify if it is the oncocytic type. Five is suspicious for malignancy, and six is malignant. So in terms of management for three and four, AUS or FN slash SFN, uh, you would do molecular, 
And then five and six, suspicious for malignancy and, and malignant, you would do a lobectomy or thyroidectomy generally. So the adequacy criteria for a thyroid specimen is you need six or more groups of 10 or more follicular cells. So this is just one representative area, but we had more than six groups of 10 or more follicular cells. So we deemed it adequate. And follicular cells, the size are generally the size of a red blood cell. So you can use that as a yardstick. Um, if there was multiple, you want to also look for microfollicles, uh, which are less than 15 cells, and cells are enraged in a circle, and at least, or at least comprise two thirds of a circle. And if you have a lot of microfollicles, that can be atypical, or it can be even um, suspicious for follicular neoplasm as well. I think talking about neoplasms. So general overviews of uh, molecular studies, PTC, uh, papillary thyroid cancer, uh, the molecular mutation you want to know is BRAF. For follicular car thyroid carcinoma, uh, you want to know about the number one mutation is RAS, and the number two mutation is PAX8 slash PPRG. And then the for medullary thyroid carcinoma, you want to know about the RET mutation, and that can be seen in men 2A and 2B. And then just going back to follicular carcinoma, uh, you cannot differentiate on cytopathology, on an FNA, whether it's a follicular adenoma or a follicular carcinoma just based on cytology, because you have to see capsular invasion or venous invasion to to identify whether it's follicular carcinoma. So in this case, we don't see any significant atypia. The follicular cells are more or less uniform in size. And here is another representative picture. There is some anis mild anisonucleosis, but it has abundant cytoplasm. So this is just kind of reactive change, what we call oncocytic change what used to be called herthaloid change. And you can see it in a background of infl inflammatory cells, like some newts. There's no prominent nucleoli. There's no, the cells aren't entirely very enlarged. There's no inkies. There's no nuclear grooves. And there's colloid as well. So this was called uh, Bethesda, this was called adequate and Bethesda category two with prominent, with a uh, number, with a good number of uh, follicles, uh, background inflammatory cells and colloid. Going back to non-diagnostic. So again, we talked about the diagnostic criteria is six groups of 10 or more cells, of uh, follicular cells. There are three exceptions when this, it would not be non-diagnostic, even despite the low number of follicles. Uh, that is when one, you have a nodule and there is prominent inflammation. Two, you have a nodule and there's prominent colloid. And three, regardless of how many there are, if you have any cellular atypia, so if you have any at cellular atypia, you want to uh, bump it up to Bethesda category three, AUS. If you have any uh, significant uh, inflammation you or colloid, you want to bump it up to benign. Okay, now this is another example of a thyroid specimen. And this is different because compared to the red blood cells, you can fit four of these red blood cells here, whereas in the prior case, you can't fit four of these red blood cells here. And there's prominent nucleoli and multiple nucleoli. And as you can see here, there's a intranuclear pseudo inclusion and inky as well. Uh, there's some nuclear grooves here and they're very cohesive. 
They're kind of potato-like, and they kind of have this vague papillariform uh, architecture. So this was actually classified as um, Bethesda Category 6, malignant. All right. Well, thank you for listening. I hope you learned something as much as I learned something by uh, sharing this. And hope you have a rest of a great night. And see you next time. Bye.